I want to talk a little bit about um, some of my reactions to the uh, the movie that's just been released, Sounds of Freedom. Grateful that uh, such a such great effort has been put towards bringing light to an unbelievable evil that exists in the world. You know, I had an opportunity once to meet Tim Ballard when I lived in Utah, worked at an agency where we were thinking of doing some work together. But I remember the thing that stands out from my meeting with him. Uh, I, it's hard to describe, but it's, there was something in his eyes that just, uh, it, there was like a, a certain stare, if you will, that you just don't see in everyday people. You know, and in and, and, and my experience being in his presence, I go, this guy has seen things and done things that most of us never will. Reminds me of this statement by Frederick Nietzsche that said, if you gaze long enough into the abyss, the abyss gazes into you. Or he who fights monsters should be careful, lest he thereby become a monster. Not in any way that I, that I think that it, Tim's becoming a monster, but I'm saying it affects. What we come across affects. All there is is influence. The longer, I, the longer I've been a clinician, that's all there is in life is just influence. Every single person that you come across leaves a mark on you and you leave a mark on them. Every single little piece of social media you see leaves a mark on you, what you give your attention to. I also worked with more closely a couple of individuals that worked with Tim and Underground Railroad, went on missions with them and stuff. Wonderful guys. They also shared that certain gaze that that um, the troubling reality of, of what they have seen. And, and I praise them for the good work in which they were engaged in, in which they were, were striving to do. It's hard for most of us to really wrap our heads around the reality of some of the things that are happening in the world. But, but the only way to really um, function appropriately in the world is, is to increase our awareness of, of what really is going on and then, and then commit our resources to doing something about it. The flip side of the story that we don't hear a lot about. Just in one one interview, one podcast that I heard when uh, Tim Tim Ballard and Jim Cavazel were were being interviewed, and and, and Jim Cavazel is the actor portraying Tim in the movie. He's a I, I think he's an amazing actor. He's one of my favorite actors. I'm grateful for those who can tell stories because that's what impacts a story. Telling a story we can relate to impacts us. And when you when you make it personal, it's like it does something to us. But the two other individuals I worked with, um, they both are no longer with Underground Railroad. It, it impacted them. One of them came to me as a wonderful father, number of children, says, I just had to get out of it. I was worried about my own family. I mean, when you're confronting monsters, it's like you you got to realize what you're what you're risking and putting out there, because these guys who are doing these type of things will stop at nothing. But at the same time, another another one of my uh, let me grab the book real quick. There's a statement I love. It's like um, this is a statement by the former um, emperor of Ethiopia, where he says throughout history. It has been the inaction of those who could have acted, the indifference of those who should have known better, the silence of the voice of justice when it mattered most that has made it possible for evil to triumph. And then this next statement is attributed to Edmund Burke, where he says, the only way for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And so I praise these guys for what they're doing, bringing the light to this issue, but it's just a part of the problem. 
But let me tell you the rest of the story. So, yep, we go in and rescue these individuals. And then you bring them out. And so we're highlighting that. And I do praise that. I'm so grateful for that. But there's only one little clip that I heard in, in one of the podcasts that I'm listening to these guys talk about the movie where it talks about their aftercare program. Well, I'm here to tell you it doesn't really exist. That is the biggest problem. There is no consistent long-term aftercare program for these individuals who come out of this world sorely underfunded and if there is there's just a few and far between that's the company that i was working with that's when tim came to us to see if there's something we could do but we just we just ran four day healing retreats for individuals who were sur adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse we didn't even deal with children and i've seen i've seen the other side when i work in the psychiatric hospital one of the most challenging cases we ever had was a 13 year old girl who was rescued from that environment. And it's it, she was 13 years old, but being in her presence, it was like she was 17. She, she had to mature, she developed. It was like, this was not a 13 year old girl, but the things she saw and the things that she was involved in, all involved in were just unspeakable. And when you work in a psychiatric hospital, I just, I just, I praise those. Those are my real heroes. Behind the scenes, can't talk about who they even see, what they do in these environments, because it's all confidential. But there's a couple of nurses that I work with. Oh my gosh, those, those guys, I'm so grateful for individuals like that. But in, in this particular case, okay, so the 13-year-old girl is admitted to the hospital. She's in, she's in the intake office. When you work in a psychiatric hospital, they have codes, codes over the loudspeaker. When you hear a code gray, it's like, that means everyone drop what they're doing, all staff, and get to the location where the code is being called. That means there's a client out of control, they're throwing chairs, they're, they're gonna kill themselves, they're gonna beat someone up, what, we gotta go take care of it. And the challenging thing in this particular hospital that I work with, we didn't have security. It's like we were the security. Nurses are the security. And, and anyway, I don't want to go down that, that rabbit hole, but um, I mean, there's reasons for it, pros and cons and all of that. But I remember walking into the intake office and here's this 13 year old girl standing facing a window and there's you know five or six staff member in the back and I, I say, okay, what's, what's going on? Well, she won't respond to us and she won't go back to the unit. So I tried talking to her, said, hey, what, what's going on? You, you're admitted to the hospital. She didn't want to be admitted. Go, not a choice anymore. It's not a choice. You do not have a choice. So we, let's just get you back to the unit, get you secure, get you in your room, stuff like that. Anyway, she wouldn't move. And then she starts banging her head against the, the window. I mean, hard enough where she was really hurting herself. And so we had to take her down and secure her. And then forcefully get her back to the unit, which is just horrible to do, but we don't have a choice. We do it as soft and gentle as possible. And she's screaming and yelling all the way, just obscenities and different things that had happened to her. And it's, it's like when she was banging her head, it's like she was, she heard her mom like trying to get out of her head, her mind, some of the things that were in her mind. That's how destructive this stuff is. And in, in the greatest work really lies in, in trying to increase funding for long-term aftercare programs for these individuals that deal with PTSD and trauma issues. It's not a simple thing. It doesn't, it doesn't happen easily. It's gonna be an ongoing thing. They will be scarred for life. It's a reality. There's no really, it, you really don't get over that stuff. You learn how to manage it, learn how to find some type of a purpose in the future. And, and anyway, that's, that's the work. But it's sorely underfunded right now. And that one of the greatest challenges that many of the, of the adult workers in the environment, they would come back and try to transition into society 
And many of them would just go back to the trade because they, they, the amount of money they could make so quickly compared to, I'm going to go hold down a job from nine to five and try to deal with the demons in my head and make 15, 20 bucks an hour, you know, compared to, I can make a thousand dollars in a day. See the, the dilemma we're involved in, in our, in our society. Anyway, this so, and I'm reminded also of uh, John Adams, one of the founding fathers of America, the Republic of America. I remember him saying that our freedom and this democracy, it will, will only be valuable to a moral people. What do you think he meant by that? A moral people. If these founding fathers could see the environment in which we are living today with the things that we're bombarded with on social media, Instagram, TikTok. My personal belief is I've, I've lived through the transition before. When I went to college, there were no computers. There were no personal computers. So I've seen what has happened as time has gone on and the weakening of of the psyche of of the world american people where they're inundated with instant gratification and pleasures beyond on control that it hijacks the limbic part of the brain the pleasure centers of the brain the stuff right now and here's the insidiousness of how all this works we have these things, just innocent, innocent things called Instagram, TikTok. Those are the most potent forms of pornography that have ever been developed. And our kids are, are you think that's, and you parents who don't understand what's out there on, on these platforms, become educated. It's, it's, it's hijacking changing the way the brains of our children work. And so the idea of, of working for something in a long-term, with a long-term goal, I, I've seen it just, it's the weakening of our society as a whole. It's like, it reminds me of Marcus Aurelius. It's a thing that he said, the great Roman emperor, right? Pleasures when unrestrained become punishments. And Thucydides, the, the Greek general, warrior, of all manifestations of power, restraint impresses men the most. You need to understand that, I'm telling you this from a clinical perspective, the brains of human beings cannot handle the things that are on Instagram and TikTok and other social media platforms can't it, it will hijack it and how all this even came to our awareness james olds peter milner they were doing experiments on mice way back in the late 1950s early 1960s somewhere in that time range and that's when they first discovered the pleasure centers of the brain and there's different stories of how they did that with mice but the bottom line is when uh, when uh, uh, a little mouse when they hooked up an electrode to the limbic part of the brain where the pleasure centers are, it would sit there and self-stimulate all day and do nothing else. Didn't care about water, food. It would just sit there and stimulate itself. We now are living in that environment. And unless we really increase our awareness and we mindfully choose and put certain things in place to help ourselves, we're at risk for going down this rabbit hole of just of distraction. And the thing is, and you may you may say, oh, it's harmless, but what, what could you be doing in a positive manner with all the time and energy that is spent in, in these other useless areas? And I just got through reading a book from another individual that, that I respect, but, it, but I don't like the story he tells. One of the main stories he tells is like, He's honoring and praising this young man 
who is now a multimillionaire because he's learned how to make videos on YouTube. But the videos are stupid. They're useless. But it's entertainment, right? But it, And so we're praising this young, I don't know how old he is, 16, 17, 18 years, and he's worth, worth many millions of dollars because he's creating content that is just pure, baseless entertainment. And it's like, ah, oh, that's the dream. Is, is that the dream? And this whole this whole thing that we as humans are caught in and envying, envying those who we think have it made. I would encourage you to be very, very careful with that. So how do you, we don't know how his life's going to go because he has $100 million. He doesn't know what it's like to work and what it's like to struggle for 10, 15 years to try to get something. And the end result of everything that people do when they go to work is to finally have enough money, so to speak, so that they can retire comfortably. But I'm at, I'm at the opposite end of the spectrum in retirement. And there is no retirement. There's no retirement. You know, meaning in life is found in the journey, being engaged in something, doing something. And this idea that someday you can reach this place and have enough money and then you can just sit and... And and in, just sit and enjoy yourself somewhere. It doesn't. It doesn't really exist. It's an illusion. Life is found in movement and change, and the only thing constant is change. And to be engaged in a worthwhile, meaningful, predetermined, self-directed goal is an important thing. And anyway, just I just wanted to give a little insight. On, on the flip end of, of kind of uh, the movie again, Sounds of Freedom, I'm grateful that those guys are, are rescuing who they are. And I know there's many positive stories, but the bulk of them, we just at present don't have the resources to really help them. And that's the frustrating part. That's where the focus needs to be next, is, is trying to, to develop. I mean, I was I was working with an agency that was trying to create this environment, trying to create a facility where women could come who had been trafficked and lived there for at least a year, but he couldn't get the funding. He couldn't get the funding. And so it all just, it all just kind of fell through. And, and uh, so that's where, that's where the work lies. It's not in entertainment. And it's, it, again, back to what John Adams said of, of our, one of the founding fathers of the American Republic, this democracy is only, will only be worthwhile for a moral people. And one of my friends who, who worked with Tim Ballard coming back from one of his missions from a third world country, I remember him describing to me a, a plane ride back. He was just so disturbed with what he saw and what he had just experienced. And he he was just questioning, almost pleading to the heavens going, what's the answer? What is the answer? And he said, he described it says, called it a download. Something, something came to me and, and, and the words came to him that said, virtue is the answer, virtue. Virtue is honor, it's integrity. It's putting off instant gratification for something more worthwhile in the long run. It's, it's about principles. It's about morals. And, and what we now, we now live in a society that we can't even ask the question, it seems like, is something right or something wrong? That's what we've done with our freedom. Even Marcus Aurelius, again, the great Roman emperor, says the first question you should ask before you do anything, is this the right thing to do? Anyway, we, we really need to do some readjusting in our society and in our world. Because when the moral fiber starts to weaken, which has happened with social media, with things on social media that are very insidiously creeping into people's life. It weakens 
their minds. It weakens their mentality. And then it leads to the next thing and the next thing. And then you think that everything, everything is just okay. That's what it does. All there is is influence. That's it. Every person that you come in contact with leaves a mark on you and you leave a mark on them. So then, so what's the answer then, right? It's for each of us to look inside of ourselves and see where we stand. Is there, maybe it starts with the question for you. For me, I, for me, it's clear. There are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. From my perspective. And, and I'm responsible for my life and so I hang on to those, but I'm not gonna start laying out what all those are because everyone's but you have to answer that question for yourself are there right things are there wrong things i think most people can say that that human trafficking is wrong but there are those people who say it's okay or the, or or it wouldn't even exist so we do live in a world where where there is good and evil the influence is all around us. The question is, where do you stand? On what side of the line? And what are you willing to do? Again, the only way for evil to triumph is for good men and good women to do nothing. We could just sit here and be passive and just let things happen and pretend that they don't exist. Like we got, we got to take a stand. Each of us have to take a stand in our life, and it begins in our own personal life. We got to take care of ourselves. If you're struggling with addiction issues, struggling with with the social media content, don't don't be too overwhelmed by it. The human brain was not meant to withstand this stuff. The best people in the world struggle with this stuff. Okay, so don't don't give up on yourself. Don't become overly frustrated. If just understand you're being manipulated. You're by a very, by very, very powerful forces. Very powerful forces. They're real. And but but I believe at the end of the day, good will overcome. It always has and it always will. But in the meantime, there's just a lot of stuff we just need to continue to work on and deal with until that day finally happens. The commitment is to be engaged in a worthwhile, positive, positive, meaningful goal in life. So search for that. So search for that in your own life. But above all, just look inside. Ask yourself the question, is the direction I am heading in right now, if I continue in this direction, where am I going to be five years from now? Is there some course corrections that you need to make, whatever that might be? That, that was the most important question that was asked to me when I was 33 years old. 33 years old, I was going nowhere, working three menial jobs, trying to provide for my family. And I thought, I just got to go back to school. I need to finish my education. I was talking to a mentor and I, and I says, there's no way I can go back to school. I can't afford to go back to school. I'm 33 years old. By the time I graduate, I'll be 37. I've got to take care of my family. How? I can't go back to school. And the mentor asked me this question that totally changed the course of my life. He says, Gordon, where are you going to be five years from now if you don't go back to school? Stop me in my tracks. And I looked in the future and I go, I do not like what I see there. I'm going to be worse off, still going to be broke. So I went back to school. I paid the price. I worked hard. Work, worked a job while going to school, while taking care of my, raising my, my four kids. Had an amazing companion, my wife. She's amazing, supportive, kind, encouraging. Such a blessing. And anyway, so I asked you to consider where, where you are right now in the world. It's never too late to make a course correction. 
if whatever you're involved in, if you're involved in this sex trafficking business, get out of it. You're afraid for your life. Get out of it. I mean, you have to you have to make the decision for yourself. But at the end of the day, here's the bottom line: we're not going to live forever. Is there really a meaning and purpose to this life? Do you really believe that one day you're gonna you're gonna stand face to face with the Creator? Is there gonna be a judgment? Is there gonna be meaning and purpose? What do you think? What do you think is gonna happen to those who are involved in this stuff? All their rationalizations, justification, minimizations, all this stuff. It's it's it if that day really exists and there really is a creator, it's just all gonna melt right before him. So we all have to take a look in, in, into our own lives and say, where are we heading? Slow down. Consider the direction you're heading in. What course directions you... And, and if you really listen to yourself, you'll know what you need to do. Just like just like I knew when I was 33 years old. Okay, I, I, can't, I can't keep on the same track. I, I need to go back. If I'm going to really provide a living for my family, I've got to go back to school. I'm not saying everyone needs to do that because there's some people that are really good with their hands in construction and stuff like that. That's not my that's not my thing. So I knew what I needed to do. I just didn't want to do it. But it was the right thing for me to do. And man, has it paid dividends. I've been able to take care of my family, don't have any financial issues any longer. Um, so there's something to pay in the price. Of, of reaching a worthwhile predetermined goal, having a vision of something. It's never too late. It's never too late. You turn around, you change courses. Remember, remember that that famous, I love Charles Dickens, right? The movie, The Christmas Carol. Remember when Charles Dickens tells the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, when, when the, he saw three ghosts, goes to Christmas past, present, and future. So he looked into the future and saw what was coming. And Ebenezer Scrooge did not like what he saw. And as the ghost, you know, showed him his tombstone and what was going to transpire in his life, he said something to the effect of, man's, yes, man's courses will foreshadow certain ends. But if the means change, then the ends will change also. Say it is thus with what you show me. Meaning that if I change courses, this doesn't have to be. Please tell me that that's true. And, and, and the moral of that story, a powerful story, and I believe it's absolutely true. And he changed courses, and that... Therefore, that end where he was going to be, that evaporated. It changed. So if you if you really look into the future five years, this brings in some quantum physics, right? Quantum physics just means there's a sea of possibilities. There's a million different possibilities. So in five years from now, there are a million, it's just a number, there's probably more than 10 billion, I don't know, unlimited versions, potential versions of yourself out there. I would encourage you using your imagination. That's where Einstein said, imagination is more powerful than knowledge. So in your mind's eye, project yourself into the future. Five years, find the, the best personification of yourself. Start to dialogue with that person and let that person pull you towards that let that person tell you what you need to do right day to, to to start today to eventually get there rather than here or here or here there really are there really are consequences to our behaviors there is there is meaning to life i mean seriously i mean look look at yourself look at the creation that you are you think you just popped into space somehow there has to be intelligent design behind this. It just makes absolutely no sense otherwise. And it seems like the greatest, the greatest challenge in life is 
it's not, it's, we're, we're here to live by faith. We're, it's not clear to anybody. No scientists, no, no one has clearly been able to delineate why things are. No one. So we're each left in this perfect schooling environment to try to figure that out and search deep in our souls for, for answer in meaningful life. There are certain things that are right. There are certain things that are wrong. Human trafficking is wrong. Human slavery is wrong. We need to, anyway, I think enough said, but uh, anyway, I just, I, again, the work, if we could just start shifting our resources to really providing long-term help to those who are un Fortunately, unfortunately, find themselves in those horrific situations, but they need help. And we and right now it's really it's really not available in the way that we need it. 